This lecture is going to be a little bit different. I gave a lecture last year, um, so we showed a lot of our products. Um, today, I think it will be a little bit different. I think we will address, so a lot of you that want to, to come here to see our work, you'll probably only, you'll see only three of our work, and some of which you've already seen. Uh, but we're trying to address an issue here, a, a very important issue, which is why does it feel so good? And the question that was given to us, it's not a title that we started, but we inherited, which is why does interior spaces, ar uh, architectural spaces look so, um, why is it so good? Is it just purely good clients? The question poses itself, or is it other ideas behind all these things? So, um, Rosanna and I will, uh, we titled this um, lecture, Three by Three by Three. So, we're gonna show three works of three artists, three architects, slash interior designers, product designers, and three of our own projects. Um, that way it's a little bit more fair, rather than showing 15 of our projects, just because we're in China doesn't mean that we just want to show you bigger and better things. That's not the reason why we're here. Um, but perhaps through these explanations and through the work of many of these great uh, artists and architects or interior designers, we will get a glimpse of why it feels so good. Okay, and I shall start uh, three by three by three with the first set of three, three artists. First one is Louise Bourgeois, one of our all-time favorite. And uh, I shall start with a quote, wherein from this quote, maybe you can see some of our answers to that question, why does it feel so good? Uh, Louise Bourgeois, uh, she talks about her work. My work disturbs people and nobody wants to be disturbed. They are not fully aware of the effect of my work has on them. She said this in 1979 about her artwork. Um, she's a French artist, um, often challenging a lot of our preconceptions of beauty, uh, about what it means to feel good. Is it important to feel good and is good good? So I don't think today we will be giving you an answer to that question, even though we have been challenged by the organizer to give you some answers. Um, we will explore some questions that hopefully you will find the answer to that question yourself. So this piece of work, The Red Room, parentheses, Parents, done in 1994, um, it, it, this embodies actually one of Naren Hu's obsessions. We, we like to talk about obsessions because these are uh, thoughts and issues that really occupy our mind and we express many of them through our work. And this obsession is about a voyeuristic gaze. Um, this piece of artwork uh, or installation is a parent's bedroom that has very vivid imagery of um, the color red and the red symbolizes many different things that happens in a bedroom. It's about birth, it's about life, it's about sex, it's about marriage, it's about happiness. Maybe um, in some traditions, and definitely the Chinese tradition that we come from, red is good, but is it really good? And it's about the child who's peeking through a small hole in the parent's bedroom door, looking through this and wanting to really know more about what goes on in the bedroom of the parents. And she has two other work uh, that we want to show here. One is Cell, 1991. These are imageries that we want to show um, because they show a sense of place, they show a sense of interior, um, but the spaces are somewhat disturbing. And why are they disturbing? We're not sure, but um, and a lot of our work, uh, particularly the interior work, we like to also challenge people's preconceptions about tradition, about expectation, about what actually is a good space. Um, and this one is also called Cell, but in parentheses, I am Mirrors, done in 1989 and 93. It's about encapsulating and also caging uh, objects, about caging uh, different things, possessions that you might have. And a lot of what we do in interior design is 
in effect, also kind of caging and uh, enclosing uh, many different things and objects. And the spatial elements and the, and the spatial kind of relationships between objects and, and, and wall and ceiling and the idea of enclosure um, brings to life a lot of other questions that we might have in life. Uh, the second artist is a man by the name of Philippe Dujardin. I think a lot of you probably have heard of him. Um, he's, um, he's very much quite young, um, or when I say young, uh, one of the organizers asked me if you're going to just show dead artists and um, architects. He is very much alive. Uh, he's a Belgian photographer. Uh, we're really intrigued by his question of beauty. So what Philippe Dujardin does is he shoots real building and masterfully abstract them and create his um, own fiction. And this fiction starts to take on its own uh, realm of beauty. And what you normally see uh, as a typical, if you look closely, it changes the perception. If you look at this particular one, which is very famous, of he takes normal objects and by questioning it, he starts stacking them and you start questioning I don't really understand the scale, nor do I understand the typology in which he's addressing. But in the process of doing so, he started creating an object, an element that starts to question the very notion um, of beauty. Uh, he emancipates himself from existing framework or typology to create his own. And in many ways, one can see a lot of work and people often say, it does look like a number of important architects today that are doing extremely spatial, extremely layer. He would take a certain object and repeat them and recreate a traditional typology and turn them around and make it something new, something refreshing, something interesting. So in Philippe Dujardin's work, we feel that what he does is he pushes the boundary of what is commonly seen as a certain typology or a notion of what a plan or what proportion should be, and yet he creates them. And we, as the viewer, starts to question what this is. Next one, another Belgium. Um, his name is not unfamiliar to everyone, I'm sure, Magritte. Um, the first work also, I think, is, is quite, um, quite important for for his, um, for his career. This is not a pipe. Everyone knows that this is all about representation and it's also something that we are quite obsessed about is uh, what representation means. Um, the reason why this is called is not a pipe because it's only an image of a pipe, right? It's not a real pipe that you can touch. It's not a pipe that you can smoke. Um, it's an image of a pipe and often in what we uh, undertake as, as projects, um, we have to either represent a brand, we have to represent um, some kind of a cultural uh, element. Um, and in the representation of, of what we do as designers, uh, we, we like to question ourselves, what is really the underlying meaning? And that's why I think Magritte is really important because all his work is about the hidden. And there's a really interesting quote by him when he talks about his own work is that he says the invisible cannot be hidden from our eyes. So designers are always working with visuals. We're, we're always working with um, things that might be pleasing or ugly to our eyes. But what we really want to get at is the content behind that form, isn't it? It's the meaning behind what we see. And uh, as the philosopher Hegel says, in art as in all human creation, it is content that plays the decisive role. So I think what we really like about Magritte is his image, of course, immediately uh, makes you question what you're looking at. And then, you know, you, you go through your conscious and subconscious to kind of figure out what those answers are. And that's what we like to do as well in, in our work. So the next we're presenting three architects, but one would argue that if all of them are architects, the first one that I'm going to introduce, th there are three. Um, the first one, uh, one probably would think, is he a furniture maker or is he really an architect? The second one is truly an architect, which all of us do know. And the third one, some would argue, is an interior designer. But let me start with Pierre Chereau and uh, Maison de Vere. Kenneth Frampton um, 
once said, which completely changed the way all architects think about Pierre Chirot and the glass house. The question was, do we see Maison d'Hiver as a house? Do we understand this as a house or as a furniture? It's a very interesting question, because if you look at this house, you start questioning. Initially, it is designed as a house, uh, but the multidisciplinary aspect of what this person, Pierre Chirot, does is immense and has a lot of influence through generation of architects. And this is also one thing that as a practice we've been trying to do is the whole interdisciplinary approach. In order to do good work, one can't just stop with architecture with a big A or perhaps just do interior design. If you're capable of being able to start doing design period, you start to change the very fabric and make things a bit more holistic. If you look at Maison de Verre, the idea is he, he works with two other individuals, but by taking this courtyard, one would say it was a renovation because he's basically taking the courtyard facade and uh, uh, the garden facade and completely change it. And it's not just a home because there's a lab, his office is down below. So that's why people often wonder why all this uh, clear glass. But if you look at this particular picture, is this really a house or is this a furniture? Yeah, from toilets uh, to the furniture, they're all built in, they all move, and in many ways, they were little machines that made his inhabitation just that much stronger. So I believe in this complexity, in the notion of the layering, the idea of color, the idea of transparency, the way the light plays with the space, I think made Maison d'Hiver significant historically. In fact, last year, Inside Festival winner used this as a reference for one of his projects, which I thought was really strong as a typology. And of course, we can't uh, talk about what, what feels good and what looks good without paying tribute to the master himself, Le Corbusier. Um, we picked one of our favorite buildings, La Tourette. Uh, we were just there earlier this year, uh, visiting the, the project uh, for the first time. And of course, as architects, since architecture school, we've studied the building, we've studied the plan. And for us, it's, a, it's an architect's architecture, right? And it, it has presence, it has mass, it has proportion, it has, I mean, it has, you know, some of the most beautiful aspects of architecture. But after going there, we actually realize something that's much deeper and more important than just architecture. It's, it's the experience through the spaces. And space is much more than just building, isn't it? The space is about the light and shadow. It's about, um, it's about surface. It's about details, trimmings, um, and it's about certain objects that you see on the wall. And it has moments of privacy in these small cells that you're um, allowed to sleep in for 30 euros per night. Um, so if you guys want a, a cheap place to stay in France, you can go there. And you can eat uh, a really nice breakfast with the monks in the morning. Um, also, it has a really beautiful church within. So it's like a microcosm of a spiritual realm. And it's something that we want to show you as a, a really interesting uh, place that feels good, but to also question why Corbusier actually made this place feel good. It's not just by um, being an architect with a big A only, but I think he really paid attention to the interior. Um, I think often enough, architects like to say, you know, uh, let's leave the interiors for other people. Um, but we as a practice, I think we really believe in the interdisciplinary nature of design. So we do architecture, we do interior, we do objects. And also here, Corbusier and um, Charlotte Perrion, they, they designed many of the original furniture pieces that works really well with the interior. Actually, I want to uh, quote that Corbusier thing. We took our, we have three children, so we took them with us on this journey. And my two youngest one was really nervous upon seeing the rooms, but my oldest son actually says it was really moving. So for a child to go into a space and for an architect to be able to move a child that's 15 years old, that's quite something. And it was through space, we didn't even talk about it. Another architect that we really like, which is to, to a lot of people is considered an interior designer, is Carlos Carpa. If you come to our practice, Carlos Carpa is very much talked about. But we have a lot of architects from Europe that's also working with us in our office in Shanghai. And often, most of these architects 
uh, they come into our office. A lot of them are prima donna. They think they know the world. And often when I use Carlos Scarpa, they go, oh, Lyndon, but he's not an architect. So I often challenge them. I said, if you can detail the way Carlos Scarpa does, then I will let you do an architecture project. If not, you're doing an interior project. So they get really frustrated. But most of these architects with a big egg that comes into my practice, I give them interior projects to do. And that's the biggest challenge for them. If they pass great detailing on those interior and have a rigorous understanding of what it is, then we, get, we let them do architecture. But if you look at Castelvecchio, for instance, I'm showing you two projects, or Corini Stampigliani. We, we go there to Venice, and if people say that Carlos Scarpa doesn't understand space, try to go to Verona, Castelvecchio. I've been there many times, and every time I go there, I am still very much moved. Not just so much about the tectonic of the space, but in which you transverse and how those little bridges and how those bridges takes you from one space to another. Uh, on the other hand, the details of the gardens that comes and gives you that human scale is very much important. Oftentimes, we just draw this big picture. Um, and yet, if you look at uh, Carlos Carpa, he is known notoriously for constantly going to the site and changing on the site, on the spot. So it is this attention to detail and oftentimes when Chinese client comes and say, oh, I want something gold, I want something blingy. And my people in my office would panic, because Lyndon, we, we didn't come to China to do gold and bling. And I said, how about Carla Scarpa? And they go, but that's so different. That's just small gold. I said, let's show it to the client. And some of them, actually, we managed to fool. And uh, when it gets built, they're very happy, because they have that element of gold in them. But the idea is Carlos Carpa is not shy in breaking materiality, in breaking through a lot of the preconceived no notion, very much like Philippe Dujardin, very much like Louis Bourgeois, to constantly challenge the normative. Um, it's not so much about what has been taught to you, but using that and create a sense of abstraction or trying to find new meaning in traditional sets of rules. So the next three sets, uh, or the next set, the third set, are three projects by our firm. Um, the first one will be mostly about interior, the second one will be an architecture project, and the third one will be a, a product design project. So I want to start with this uh, piece of artwork by Andres Jeffler, done in 2004 when he was in Berlin, uh, Supervisions, it's called. It's based on images of urban areas revealing both views of public sites and their surfaces, as well as offering insights into closed areas from a bird's eye perspective. By means of an elaborate photographic technique, Jeffler creates these possible and impossible viewpoints. Possible meaning their actual shots that they take, so it's reality. Impossible meaning um, he cut off these different shots, uh, put them together as a collage, but he conceals the idea that it's a collage. So he makes it look like it's actually a plan, but this is an impossible plan because it's made out, it's made up of different um, different pieces. So it's different fragments making a whole. And that's um, something that we had to do in this next project called Design Republic Design Commune. Um, this is a really interesting project right in the heart of Shanghai in the Jing'an district. Uh, if you know Shanghai, uh, the, the main kind of business hub or shopping district is um, a place called Plaza 66. So this is about three, four blocks behind uh, Helong Guangchang. Uh, Plaza 66. So we were given this um, turn of the century building built by the British and you can see in these uh, architecture drawings that uh, it's a very kind of squarish institutional, it has a real kind of statement about that the, the British are occupying this concession. This is a very shameful past in um, Shanghai's history, in China's history as well. This is when uh, many European countries actually came to the city and occupied different parts of the city where the city had to give concession to them. Um, and without actually going further into it, this is one of, this is one of the remnants of that era. So in many ways, um, the, the city has a very kind of a strange memory of, of this building. At the same time, it's part of the history, but um, 
it's also a, a part of a, a shameful history, not so much a glorious history. Um, and so when the government came to us uh, with something like this, they wanted us to actually help them conceptualize what to do with it because the building has gone through so many different uses. Um, this is on the, on the left side, on your left side, this is how it came. Uh, that's the British Army or the British police force, I'm sorry, in Shanghai um, in 1910. And then later on during communist era, the height of the communist era, it was a public high school. Um, and then later on when China opened up economically under Deng Xiaoping, um, Shanghai became a flourishing kind of financial center. And so this place actually housed uh, what was then the Chamber of Commerce in that district. So, you know, businessmen, trading, and really in many ways, um, advocates of the free market, right? Uh, they're actually there meeting and, and talking and uh, planning their business. Um, but when we took over, uh, or when the government came to us about three years ago, this is when the city uh, was, was named um, for that first year by the UN, uh, a design city. So the city wanted to um, start to affirm its kind of position as a creative city, but yet most government officials in China, they really don't quite understand what creatives do. They don't understand how to actually work with the creative industry. So they came to us and asked us for advice. So we actually gave them an idea of creating this place to become a design community center, something where the designers can come to. And so, so that was kind of the political history. And I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the, the concept of creating old and new. So on the left side, you will see um, in black and white what was given to us. And on the right side is what we did to the project. So the approach is a surgical approach, we like to call it. The project takes on a surgical approach to renovation, first gently removing the decaying wood and plaster, then carefully restoring the still vibrant red brickwork while grafting on skin joints and organs into parts that needed reconstruction. And finally, with the attachment of a brand new appendage, which, like a prosthetic, enables the existing building to perform new functions. The nearly abandoned building now takes on a new life. So the idea of a new life is really important to us because there are many different ways to work on a historic building. And we take the position that uh, if something is lost, it's lost. Um, it's not like if you lose your hand, you can gain a new hand. If you lose a hand, you, 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 you can, you can uh, get something that will replace the hand, but it's no longer what you have. And I think same thing with buildings. Um, if the interior is lost, I think it's lost. We, what we don't want to do is to go back to historic buildings and see what used to be the awning there or what used to be the corners there and recreate that cornice and apply it back. I mean, for us, that's, um, that just seems not, not what historic renovation should be about. So what we, what we wanted to do for this building is um, be true to what was lost but give it some new life so it can take on new, um, new functions. So again, you can see some of these uh, old and new contrasts. And so the new functions that happens here are the first and second floor now becomes a, a exhibition space uh, and a showroom for a high-end modern furniture uh, place. And so like, these views you would not be able to get from the second floor looking down. Um, the left one is looking down at the entry door, and the right one is looking down at one of the corridor, the main corridor. You wouldn't, you wouldn't gain these perspectives from the old building, but now you can with this one. This is looking into the courtyard, and also uh, before you would not have that glass box where you can actually display um, some of the exhibition pieces that is in the showroom. And this is uh, one of those spaces that now um, is, the, is the modern furniture showroom. And that sign actually is one of the signs that we just left. Um, we wanted to kind of commemorate that it used to be the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, that's, the, that, that's what it says in, in Chinese. And upstairs, we also um, helped the government to kind of conceptualize this 
uh, design platform where uh, different lectures and events can happen uh, up on the third floor. So it's, a, it's an empty space most of the time and allowing different events uh, and exhibitions to take place. And upstairs on the third floor, on the other side of the building, uh, there's this place that we call the one room hotel. So there's a full bathroom, full bedroom, um, kitchen, living room, dining room. So designers can come here and cook, have parties, have uh, dinners. Uh, we've had concerts there. Uh, so really it's a very active community place for designers in Shanghai. And flanking uh, the building, there's this leftover space that now we uh, made into a tapas bar. So it's a, it's, a, it's a dining and social club, sort of, for people nearby. And there's a video that I want to play. To remember this building was when we took over it was completely dilapidated uh, all the windows were all covered up with eight nine different types of windows and people were just clamping and there was still a series of school going on um, but at the same time government offices and it was uh, a few developers had come and wanted to keep the facade just to appease the government and build two towers uh, behind it and both Rosanna and I actually went and talked to the vice mayor and we said, if you're really serious about this, you talk about Shanghai being real and serious, why don't we try to keep this? And they said, you want this old building? You really want this old building? And so they said, give me two weeks. We came back two weeks later, they said, it's all yours. We'll do something for you. We will renovate it according to your specification and no more tower. So the developer to this day has not stepped in here because he's very upset that his two towers was not built. But I think in the process of what we're trying to do is, especially in a city like Shanghai, um, it's almost imperative uh, that we make sure that some of our history is uh, kept. Um, the next project um, I want to talk about is, is a project that I think a lot of you probably have seen. If you heard my lecture last year, you've probably seen this, but there's a lot of requests uh, from the organizer and number of people about recreating this um, showing this hotel again, which is called Waterhouse. Uh, we wanted to show other things, but let me just briefly go over this uh, project. Um, this is a photographer by uh, Van der Hulls, a Dutch photographer. Um, he did a lot, he captured a lot of nice images in Shanghai. Um, and it's interesting because if you look at this photographer, a lot of the local Shanghainese would not understand some of the significance of why these are considered beautiful. And yet it takes a foreign eye to come in, same images, depict certain things that becomes amazingly fen and, or phenomenally beautiful. Chinese would go to Europe and take certain pictures that Europeans probably would, would ignore or, or not look at closely, and yet it is shown in a different light. It is in the sense of foreignness that sometimes we find certain things uh, that are relevant. So what I want to try to show you is a project called Waterhouse. I'm going to quote Calvino. Arriving at each new city, the traveler finds again a pass of his that he did not know he had. The foreignness of what you do no longer or no longer possess lies in wait for you in foreign, unpossessed places. So when we were given this project, it's not this bun. It's called the bun, but it's not the glorious 1930s bun that you see, that you capture. It's actually south of the bun. And south of the bun, actually it's notorious for a number of things. It's called the cool docks, it's not so cool. Um, in the past, uh, a lot of drugs were being carried through this particular area and there were a lot of um, warehouses in here and obviously to revive a lot of these warehouses, the Chinese government wanted 
to demolish a lot of these warehouse and turn them with brick beautiful buildings. And of course, the first thing we did, and they approached uh, Lok Leng Peng, who's and this is Singaporean, so this is Singapore, so it's a Singapore hotelier. And it, he came and appointed us, and the first thing he asked us was, Lyndon, what do you think of their uh, concern? Should we demolish this um, building? We obviously didn't want to do that. Um, and we said, Peng, if they want to demolish, we're not the architect. And um, we also said another thing, Peng, we're not interested in tourists, the tourist trade. Imagine trying to convince a hotelier we're not interested in tourists, we're interested in travelers. What's the difference? The tourist comes in and have a checklist of the things they want to see. They see the Huangpu River, they see this beautiful Xin uh, in, in in Shanghai, and they take the um, um, guide and say, I've been to Shanghai, now I'm going to Beijing, right? For those of us that are more hip, you probably have a wallpaper guide, and you go, okay, let me go to the cool places, and after that's done, I'm done with Shanghai, I'm over. We're more interested in the travelers. The ones that are interested in the market, we're interested in sort of how those clothes, why people actually wash, their, um, wash themselves out on the street, um, and this is very much part of Shanghai's life today. It's not just because of an economic situation. The whole notion of community is very much relevant. For instance, the hanging clothes. Yeah? Often you say when you're richer, you would get a dryer and a washer and a dryer. People still don't use dryer in China. They still hang their clothes. It went from cheap clothing to fake Prada. Now it's real Prada. Okay? Chinese are getting wealthier. They still hang their clothes. It's now real Prada. So, Oftentimes now that problem is security, but that's a different issue. So what happened is within this layer of spaces, you do see people eating, you see people bathing themselves, you see the very uh, inside of people's lives. And this is very much a community. The proximity of spaces are so tight and so close. Um, I live in a place where in our bathroom, is literally about three meters away from my neighbor's kitchen. So if my curtain is not drawn out, sometimes in the morning, I actually, the, 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 the mother would see me naked. And I have to pretend that I had no problems with it, even when I do. So if you look at this particular project, this is an old warehouse. And we made sure that we did not want to demolish this. And we made clear that if, we, if they were going to demolish, we were not the right architect. It was a Japanese uh, army. Uh, barrack and um, we tried to convince them give us an opportunity so along these derelict uh, buildings um, here it was the old buildings what's important there were three things that we were trying to pursue if you look at the plan it seems generic but there's really three things that we were trying to pursue one was the blurring of the public and the private the celebration of this vertical lane houses uh, building in Shanghai has been demolish at, an, at a rate that is um, unprecedented uh, globally. And it was important for us to understand the essence of it. And the third was to really um, have this notion of old and new, to try to understand. And um, so what we did with uh, public and private, if you look at the floor plan, the restaurants are actually completely transparent. So you actually see the garden and you see the sidewalk. And on the other side, Sorry about this. No, I'm not. Oh, this is red. Her hand, use her hand. So this transparency, this transparency. So the blurring of the public and the private um, is very much relevant. Well, I'll show you on the images. There's also section cuts, so the rooms the rooms, and later I'll show you the picture. These are rooms, oftentimes in hotels. Oftentimes in hotels, um, they would divide this and would have a sharing door. We actually cut it sectionally, so you can view um, the restaurant down below. So this is the building that we were talking about. Uh, we added this uh, new wing up above, and there is really a clear delineation between the old and the new. And we kept everything like the way this is. I've told this story many times. Uh, my parents came and visited us and says, we thought 
you know, Lyndon, I thought you were crazy when you were eight, but I really think you're really absolutely insane uh, for to, one, to do this, and second, to actually convince your client that this is actually okay. Um, but in keeping with uh, actually the integrity of the structure, uh, we've managed to keep what is um, the old warehouse. And that's a one bedroom right there above that looks down into the check-in counter. Um, so there's this really voyeuristic nature to this whole thing, which is very much part of the life in Shanghai today. If you look at lane houses, there is this, you're constantly challenged with dining spaces, living spaces. Um, so if you're not careful, if you look at this section, um, this is the restaurant. Most of the people do not know this, but you actually, from the bar, from here, from here, people actually can see you dining. And people who are dining can actually look at the different bedrooms. I have a lot of friends and clients who have stayed in this hotel and says, London, why didn't you tell me that from my to toilet someone can actually look at me? And I said, oh, I, I'm sorry, that's a minor detail. But um, having said that, even what we did was we kept all the existing stairway. There were about four of them uh, because obviously, the Japanese were storing a lot of um, not legal stuff. So you can imagine that they had different ways of going up the stairs because by doing this, uh, when the security comes, they have different ways of channeling all their goods. Um, so we kept all that and they in turn became the bridges uh, for the door, uh, for the entry for the bedrooms. So this is not a mirror, nor is this a reflection. Basically you look down and you see the restaurant and a lot of people say, Lyndon, this is really disturbing. Actually, if you have children, we have three, this is actually perfect. When they're young, you want to make sure, especially on a double wing room, most hotels right now just have one door. Here, you could ex do it, you know exactly what they're doing. When they become teenager, you want to know even more, right? So this whole idea, in the name of design, actually, family become very happy. So, Again, the blurring of the public and the private. So when you're eating there, literally people would look at you as they walk along this street. And the idea of these are all recycled um, floor from the top roof that was collapsing. In my studio, we actually did a lot of these tables because at the end, the um, contractor wanted to use new wood. And they just did not understand why we're re reusing some of these old woods that to him was considered really bad. But you see the sectional quality, and again, this looks into the courtyard. So these are the courtyard with the recycled um, louvers. And this is a garden up above. There are better pictures now. But this actually be became uh, the little garden um, for Jason Atherton, who's the chef in here. And he had planted a lot of things. So and it's all embedded, so you have a different view of the bun. Um, we have a little video of this. Sorry. People often ask us when we um, present this project whether this is a stylistic thing. We don't do this in all our projects, but to us this was important. It's an attitude of preservation. It's about understanding using an existing typology that was a warehouse and turning them into something new, rather than just having that automatic reaction of demolishing everything which the government has always in their mind. And what we're trying to do is they're trying to make a statement to the government that preservation in the right way, in a fresh way, can be significant. Because to us, what made Shanghai where it is today is all the beautiful lane houses. It is history that tells us about the future. Without the history, there is no future. And for us, this is very relevant for not just us, but for our children. Without a lot of the patina of the community, we will have, Shanghai will be not significant tomorrow. At the end, we're gonna show you, uh, both of us and I'm gonna speak. Um, it's a project, a product design that we did for wallpaper. Um, and 
this was not, people have asked me whether we did this after we got the wallpaper design of the year this year, but that's not the case. Uh, we actually did this before it happened. But we want to show you through um, this video, and we're explaining in, in this video. And it, it'll be quite clear. Can you guys hear? Being Chinese designers, obviously, we had to do something that somewhat relate uh, to the context where we practice. So we thought, what would be something similar to a picnic basket in the Chinese context? So we thought of Bian Dan, which is a lunchbox. It's interesting because we were trying to also create an object that will be incorporated into Jaguar. And since the interior of the Jaguar is already so perfect, we thought a picnic basket would be a great addition. From a tea set, to a candle holder, to a necklace, to a wooden plate. Things that are very Chinese in many ways. There's a lot of thinking behind you know, how the inside of the box is, is related to the outside. There are these openings of lines that allow you to see through to the interior of the box. So there's, there's a lot of architectural qualities to to this piece. I think this is one piece that allowed us actually as architects to explore the spatial quality of an object in sort of its sectional form, but at the same time, the, the blurriness of public and private is also seen through this piece. So when you're carrying this piece outside, in many ways people can see a glimpse of what you're carrying, you know, what you're going to actually eat that day or what that kind of celebration is. It's quite evident when Wallpaper Jaguar was sponsoring this, we had to do a product that can complement Jaguar, and it has to have new technology. So by using carbon fiber, uh, immediately the first thing we thought of was a picnic basket, you know, by the English countryside. But as Chinese architects, we also thought to ourselves, what, what would that mean if it's just picnic basket? That's why we use the word pientang, which is um, a lunch box. Um, most of us that are educated in Asia, you have lunch boxes. I had lunch boxes when I went to school. And yet at the same time it had, it appeased to the idea of a picnic basket uh, for Jaguar. Um, and also at the same time it's very architectural, it's very sectional. It's a stack of buildings. Uh, so when you actually bring this picnic basket, unlike the picnic basket that we use, this is extremely transparent and extremely sectional. So um, as architects, this um, became important to us. So the multidisciplinary uh, practice that uh, we believe in um, and, and um, we do in, in our work in Shanghai is important. And those three artists that we showed you, the three, archi the three dead architects that we showed you, in a lot of those works, which we respect, you can see the layering and the multidisciplinary nature in each of their work. So thank you. Thank you.